G'day legends and welcome back to the sixth and final episode of Adventure Kings Presents A Beginner's Guide to Camping. Now if you're just tuning in and you've just found this series then do yourself a favour don't skip over the first five episodes because they've got some cracking information in them and I've put links to each of the first five episodes in the description. And in this episode, this sixth and final episode, Khan and I are going to sit down and answer as many questions that you've asked in the first five episodes as possible. So we've scoured the comments sections, uh, we've made a list, I've even printed it out because I've got a memory like a goldfish half the time and we'll try and get through as many as we possibly can. Now, as always, before we get into it, make sure you hit like, subscribe, and that notification bell so you don't miss any other videos that we're putting out. Righto, Breno, what have we got? Alrighty, the first question is an absolute pearler. So, how to find good places mm. to go camping, that's gotta be the eternal camping question. Yes. So, something we've been using for a good couple of years now is the uh, VMS 700 HDX cool four-wheel drivers and campers GPS. It's got a heap of free campsites that are uh, pre-programmed already into it. And what I really love about it is you can search for an area, say you want to go a couple hours up the coast, you look for a, a town, it'll show you free campsites in the area and it'll actually take you all the way to them with the navigation. And another method of finding campsites that we've been having a lot of success with lately is a website called UCamp. Now what this does, it's kind of like the Airbnb of camping. It connects you with um, private property owners, lets you go camping on private properties. You're gonna pay for that privilege anywhere between maybe five bucks and sometimes up to $30 a person a night. So it's obviously more expensive than the free camps that you find in a VMS, but especially on like busy weekends, uh, school holidays, long weekends, that sort of stuff. Sometimes paying that little bit for a private campsite, it is definitely worth it. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing we have the benefit, I guess, is that we're all camps and four drivers. And you guys probably have a lot of mates who are camps and four drivers as well. Pull your knowledge, ask around, and I'm sure you'll be able to find a bunch of good spots. Another good option, go into your local four drive super center store and speak to the staff, because they're all four drivers and campers, and they'll probably have some hot tips on that local area as well. And uh, if you do find a really good site, send us an email, because we're always looking for new ones. Definitely. So that is definitely a good question. How do you run a removable 12 volt system? So you're the 12 volt guru around here, mate. I'm gonna throw this one across mm. to you. So thinking about this, if you want something that's temporary and really easy, this is what I would personally do. I'd run a battery box and an AGM battery. That mm -hmm. means you can run it inside your vehicle. It's easy enough to move around and put it in and out when you don't need it. And what I would then do is run a solar blanket and I'd buy a 240 volt charger for home. Now what I do to run this setup is basically while you're driving to camp, have all your accessories running off the vehicle. So plug your fridge into the 12 volt socket in the back of your Prado, and then when you get to camp, unplug your fridge, plug it into the battery box, and set your solar up. Now that's gonna give you at least a couple of days, and if the sun's out, you get up to a week of power, quite easily, as long as you've got that sun. And then when you get home, just take the battery box out, plug it into charger, and give the battery a really good charge back up. So it's temporary, super easy, and it's not gonna cost you that much money. Sounds like a cracking setup, yeah. and probably something that I'd just throw in there is um, if you're gonna do a setup like that, if you've got a battery in a battery box, put it in the footwell, don't put it on the seat, because if you do hit the brakes in an emergency mm. stop, you don't want that, what, 30 odd kilos of battery moving anywhere. Yes, yeah, or strap it down in the back. If you have drawers or something, make sure you use those tie downs. Hmm, cool, alrighty. cracking question and there's definitely mm. two parts to that there. So first let's talk how to choose the right campsite when you get yep. to a campsite, yep. where to set up camp. Mm -hmm. And then after that, let's talk about how to set your camp up to deal with bad weather. Absolutely. So camping site selection. So when you get to camp, how to choose the right place to set your camp up? Well, the number one thing is even on nice days like we've got today, uh, you can never be certain that there's not a storm just around the corner. So the number one thing you should be cautious of is water courses and where water runs so don't ever set your campsite up in the sharp v of a gully or um, between two sharp sand dunes or down in a river bed um, even if it's a completely dry river bed you never know if there's been storms 500 kilometers up river that are only just starting to run down through now so they're definitely things to avoid also be aware of uh, wind is a big one as well and use any natural wind breaks that you can whether you can um, camp in the lee of a um, of a mountain or on the side of some uh, bushes if you don't have any natural wind protection use your car to set up a bit of a windbreak 
And then the other thing as well, that's uh, something that we do a lot is just consider where the sun's gonna rise in the morning. So when it's winter, you obviously want a bit of nice warm sun of a morning. So we usually set up swags on the eastern side of the car. So the sun hits the swags first thing in the morning. Conversely, um, in summer, when you don't want to be hit by that blazing sun first thing in the morning, use your car, put your car on the eastern side of your swags. That way you've got a little bit of extra shade of a morning and just keeps those temperatures down. So what about when you're out camping and the weather does turn? How do you um, set a campsite up for protection from wind, from rain, that sort of stuff? Yeah, so once you've found that perfect site, and you know you're not gonna have any trouble in that regard. The next thing to do, even if it's a perfect sunny day, peg everything out really securely. So don't just set your awning up and think it'll be fine. Make sure you peg it out every time. And in addition, if you are expecting any poor weather, definitely peg it out more than you usually would. So you can get ground grabber pegs, which actually screw right in and offer you a whole lot more strength, or just use those longer pegs or more pegs. You can definitely put two through the same peg hole to give you that extra strength. If it does come over and the weather starts to change, don't wait until it's so bad, you then need to run around and try and hold everything down and peg it. Make sure at the first drop of rain or the first gust of wind, you get out and actually give it a once over. And just something else to add in there is if you've got some rain on the forecast, set your awning or your gazebo up to channel the rain away from your campsite. So don't just leave the gazebo or the awning set up evenly so the water's gonna pull, because it may, in the worst case, actually damage the awning or the gazebo. Just drop a leg, Yes. drop a leg down on the low side of your camp so that the water runs down and away from your camp. And um, yeah, you'd be pretty well set. Yeah. One more little tip as well that I've just thought of, if you are setting up and it's nice and windy, a good idea if you've got some storage boxes or even if you're the sort of person who takes your fridge out while you're camping, run them next to your vehicle and in between your wheels and it's just gonna provide a bit more protection from the wind coming underneath as well. So you'll, you'll be a bit more protected. Cool. Okay, so this is a good one for you, Khan. <laughs> Can someone tell me what the weight limit for a rooftop tent would be? I've been thinking of getting one but with my fat, mm, I'll censor that word. I'm concerned I'm gonna snap the hinges on the fold out rooftop tents and land on, land on the ground in the middle of the night. <laughs> well, don't worry is the first thing. Basically, the rooftop tents are super strong. They do have those strong steel hinges that hold them out. And then the ladder actually takes a third of the weight. So the majority of the weight's actually taken by your roof rack and then a third of the weight is loaded up by the ladder. And we've actually put a whole lot of weight, more than sort of five people in a rooftop tent during our testing to make sure they are all good. The other thing is your vehicle has a dynamic roof loading and a static roof loading. So your manufacturer will have given you a sort of roof weight limit of say 200 kilos. And that's while the vehicle is in motion or a dynamic weight rating. So that means while you're driving along hitting corrugations, you can have 200 kilos on your roof and you can imagine how much force that is as it's going up and down. So when your vehicle's actually stopped, you set up your rooftop tent, you're up in there, there's not a whole lot of actual force on the roof. So you don't need to worry about damaging anything in that regard either. So basically, don't sweat it one bit. You're gonna be sorted if you're in a rooftop tent, yeah. you'll be right. <laughs> okay. Cool, so I definitely reckon that one of the best things that you can add to a 12 volt system in the back of your vehicle is a battery charger. Um, I love to leave that fridge on 24 seven, I just don't turn it off. Got a 138 amp hour battery in the back of it and I've got a 110 watt solar panel on the roof, but sometimes those two things combined still means that the battery goes flat, a uh, week of cloudy, rainy weather, me not driving a whole heap of places. That's where a 240 volt charger comes into play. So. I've actually permanently um, connected it to the battery, just connected it to the positive and negative posts on the battery. And then I've got one of those caravan accessory type places um, to wire in a um, caravan 240 volt outlet. So that's got the male 240 volt connector on the side of the ute. You don't have to do that. Um, you could just leave the connector on the end of the battery charger just inside your canopy or your trailer or wherever it is and just then connect an extension yep. lead when you need to. But I love being able to just pull up in the garage at night, um, especially if I haven't been driving for a whole lot of time and I see that the battery's running a bit low and just plug an extension cord in. Um, highly recommend it. I don't reckon there's many things that I love that have got me out of as much trouble as a 240 volt battery charger. And just to um, throw this into the mix as well, even if you are on a big trip, 240 volt battery chargers are an amazing idea because 
a lot of the time you may not do a lot of driving. Say you go up to the Cape, say you cross the, the Simpson Desert, uh, you go up to the Kimberley, something like that. You might get to a point in that big trip where you're only doing an hour's driving a day, you get into some amazing spots. After a couple of days, you find that your batteries are pretty flat and they're in need of a charge. Well, there's nothing better than planning to pull into a little town. You get to a caravan park for the night, you pay for a powered campsite, go and have a nice shower, wash the dust off from behind the ears, and while you're doing it, overnight, you plug your 240 watt battery charger in and straight away, like that the next day, everything's 100% topped up again. Yes. So highly, highly recommended. Yep. So, a cracking question and one that I'm definitely not qualified to answer, so Khan, this is on you, mate. Righto, so your vehicle chassis and earth strap that is already on your starter battery, whether you need to upgrade it. Okay, so the good news is because it's quite short and it is quite a large gauge of wire, there's not gonna be much voltage drop even if you do add a whole host of 12 volt accessories. The second part is if you are running a winch, it'll have its own earth that goes directly to the battery. If you're setting up a standard sort of dual battery isolator or a dual battery kit, It'll have a short length of earth cable and they're designed to mount to your body or chassis your vehicle. And because that's not a huge setup, it's not gonna add a whole lot of extra strain onto your existing wiring. Now, if you are running sort of a DC-DC charger or a bigger battery bank, we do recommend for an optimal setup, you'd actually run an entire earth from your second battery all the way back to your starter battery again. That's gonna give you a better charge rate, less voltage drop, and it's not gonna overload those factory wires. Not that it really would anyway, but it means you've got completely separate setups, so nothing is impacting on anything else. Short answer, it's not going to affect it at all, but if you do add a whole lot of 12 volt accessories, you can add those extra earth cables anyway. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a question I've always wanted to know the okay, answer to, right. drawing upon that question. Uh, I've got a battery in the back of my ute. A lot of people yep. put a battery in the back of their car, in the, around the drawers, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. In that scenario, when you've got your second battery at the rear of the vehicle, is it better to earth straight to the chassis at the back of the vehicle or run the earth all the way back to the front battery? Ideally, you'd run an earth all the way back to the starter battery. Um, and that's because copper has a much better conductivity than steel. So the steel in your chassis doesn't actually conduct electricity as well as the copper. But then you've got to think there is a lot more steel in your chassis than there is in one little wire. Either one's going to work, but if you were wanting the absolute best setup, you would run an entire earth. Hmm. If you don't have it, don't worry too much, it's still gonna work, but if you do find any issues, that's a good way to troubleshoot and try and fix it. Good information. Alrighty, next question. Okay, so another question for you, mate. What would be the ideal battery bank to have? Okay, now a second ago you mentioned you've got a 138 amp hour battery in the back of this and you run your fridge all the time. You've got a 90 litre fridge. And that's the thing, a lot of people probably these days with so many people having 12 volt setups is they don't realise that for about the last 20 years, every four driving campers may do with about a 100 amp hour deep cycle battery. These days with things more affordable and more 12 volt gadgets, a lot of people are trying to upgrade to a bigger setup. But to be honest, you get away with a 100 amp hour in 95% of camping situations. Now, if you are the sort of person who wants to run more camp lighting and you have to charge iPads and devices and all sorts of things, you absolutely could step up your battery. So rather than a 100, you could go to a 120. Uh, if you had a 120 or you're looking at a 120, you could step up to like a 138. And that's gonna give you that little bit extra capacity to deal with. Uh, you could also add two batteries of the same capacity. So you might run two 100 amp hours, but it's not really necessary unless you've really got a lot of power needs. And following up from that, to say what's the best battery bank, Sort of like how long's a piece of string. Bigger's always better, but then you've sort of got added wiring to deal with and it's gonna be a fair bit heavier. So a single battery is gonna work in almost every situation. And if you are a bit concerned, just step up to the next biggest size. So there's that old analogy of thinking of your batteries like a bank vault and the electricity that's going in and out of the batteries like yep. the coins that you're putting in or mm -hmm. taking out of the mm -hmm. bank vault. Doesn't matter how big that bank vault is, there's still only a definite amount of coins that you're putting yep. in or taking out. And that's where things like solar come into play. Um, doesn't matter how many batteries you have, you still gotta figure out a way to charge them. Absolutely, and if you can keep them all topped up, whether you have a single 100 amp hour or three 120 amp hour batteries, keeping them topped up all the time means you've essentially got infinite power anyway. So if you've got a solar panel that's powering your 100 amp hour, it's never dropping below sort of 95 or 100% capacity, you wouldn't need any more batteries anyway. Righty, okay, one final question, and it's right. a cracker. Okay.
first of all, I reckon that that's something that we probably won't be able to solve just in a quick chat here. I reckon mm. there's almost, no, I don't reckon there's almost, I reckon there's, there's definitely, yeah, yep. there's a whole video there. So I reckon what we'll do a couple of weeks down the road is we'll do a bonus part seven. We'll do uh, gear preparation, storage, and cleaning. Mm. We could do like vehicles. Mm. We can talk about all the gear that we use because we do use it so regularly. And obviously we keep it in top nick because we have to, because we use it so often. But it's not that hard. Um, we could absolutely do a whole video on that. But in the meantime, have a look at another link that we put in the description to our mate, Chad. He's our resident cooking and backyard barbecue expert. He's done a cracking video on cast iron care and reseasoning your cast iron cooking gear. So that's mm. definitely one worth watching. Well, there you go. Your most common and most popular questions answered. And that just about brings us to the end of episode six of Beginner's Guide to Camping. Uh, but as I mentioned a moment ago, I reckon in a couple of weeks time, we'll add to this series and we'll mm. talk about um, gear storage and gear care. I reckon that's about it for us, yeah. eh? Again, if you like this video, make sure you hit like, hit subscribe so you don't miss anything else we're putting out on the channel. And of course, hit that notification bell so you know when it happens. Thanks again, guys. Cheers for watching. Catch you next time.